Joining us here in Washington, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Senator, it's great to have you. When you were listening to President Zelensky, he spoke for two hours on Friday. You were in attendance at that virtual, virtual meeting. Afterwards, you said the following, Senator. Listen. Zelensky needs to win. The Ukrainian freedom fighters need to win. We don't need them just to lose more slowly. We need them to win. And to win, they need to kill Russians. And to kill Russians, they need more weapons. He's already sent considerable military aid, including, I want to put this on the screen, Stinger anti-aircraft systems, Javelin anti-armor weapons, radar systems, grenade launchers, guns and ammo, helicopters, boats and vehicles, tactical gear and medical equipment. As of this week, the U.S. is also sending switchblade drones. Uh, short of sending these fighter jets that people have talked about, what else would you add to that list, Senator? Well, so we need more javelins, we need more stingers, we need the, the switchblade drones to have been there weeks ago. The, the biggest problem here is that the administration has a bunch of lawyers who are treating this as if it's a CYA PR crisis instead of the national security crisis it is. And so my message to the president is simple. Stop listening to all of your advisors who say Zelensky's a dead man walking. Stop listening to those who say that Ukraine is inevitably going to lose. We should hear the president's strategy to help Ukraine win. We should be on the side of these freedom fighters, and we're too slow in almost every step we take. But when you say win, do you <clears throat> mean that we should help Zelensky help Ukraine win at all costs? We have a bunch of fighters in Ukraine. By, by that, I mean the free, the West has a bunch of fighters in Ukraine, and that is the Ukrainians. These 44 yep. million people have been heroic in fighting for values that are universal but associated around the world with American beliefs and freedom. We don't need to have fighter pilots in the air. We don't need to have boots on the ground inside Ukraine because Ukrainians have the will to fight. We need to have the will to rearm them constantly. Yeah, uh, this week, Senator, you voted against a massive spending bill that included an aid package for Ukraine. Do you see a mixed message there? You've said you're against an all or nothing approach and that you think your critics are being political here, but do you see the potential at least for a standalone aid package that might sail through? The administration should have sent up an emergency supplemental weeks and weeks and weeks mm. ago. The bill we passed this week was crap. It's thousands of pages. It comes out in the middle of the night. The Ukrainian aid portion of that omnibus was eight tenths of one one percent of the bill we should be focused on the urgent issue which is rearming uh, the ukrainians and that could have been done as a standalone bill in 10 minutes yeah this week the house voted to end normal trade relations with russia and belarus the bill raises tariffs on goods from both countries and obligates the white house to make a push to remove russia from the world trade organization senate majority leader chuck schumer intends to move this through the senate quickly to get the bill to the president's desk where do you plan senator to vote on this bill yeah we should cut the russians off from the from the global economy i'm a zealous free trader but this isn't an issue of free trade this is about an illegal immoral unjust invasion of ukraine and we should be cutting russia off from all international markets your republican colleague senator mike crapo has said that he's looking to include the russian oil ban in the legislation will you have any objections to the bill if the ban is not included in that we should take every extra step we can to cut russia off from global markets more and more and more that should include oil we should also be moving toward energy independence the biden administration should get out of the way of north american energy production so that europeans don't continue to make so many stupid decisions of uh, tying themselves to putin at putin's energy supplies mm -hmm. so we should cut off russia from energy supplies but we should just be taking every step to ratchet up the pressure on we're going to talk about this later but what do you make of, of Saudi Arabia and China, this oil deal. And the reason I ask is because there's now talk that they could use Chinese currency for yeah. this, right? And that's a big deal because, you know, the U.S. dollar has been the benchmark yeah. for oil, international, all trading oil. And now, you know, Saudi Arabia unhappy with, with the United States and kind of inching toward China. Your thoughts? Yeah. So first of all, just this point of the Saudis pricing some of their commodity in Chinese currency mm -hmm. or signaling that that's where they're headed, that is a big bad thing. But let's take a bigger step up. The 10 year out existential battle on the globe is between the United States and, and Western values against the Chinese Communist Party's uh, exported surveillance state oppression of, of peoples around the globe. And a lot of people would say, 
pace, as you're always saying we need to be pivoting toward Asia, we need to be focused right. on the long-term technology battle with the CCP. Why is the Russian invasion of Ukraine such a bad deal? Uh, why is it such a big deal at this moment? Partly because Chairman Xi greenlit this invasion. And so we need to recognize that defeating Vladimir Putin or helping the Ukrainians defeat Putin here is an important shot across the bow of Chairman Xi, who wanted to see if the West had any will to stand up to Putin, because Xi desires to seize Taiwan. And so these things like trying to displace the dollar, which is one of the Chinese Communist Party's mm -hmm. objectives, we need to keep our eye on this because we need to demonstrate that freedom-loving peoples around the world would rather have U.S. leadership than Chinese oppression. When you hear the White House say, you know, the president and she talked for two hours, when you hear the White House say something to the effect of, listen, he's been told that if he supports Russia, there will be consequences, but not really laying out those consequences, which tends to be a pattern. What do you think about that? Yeah, we, we need the administration to demonstrate why the globe should be looking to the U.S. and not to the Chinese Communist Party. The future of the world 10 years out is either going to be more free trade, human rights, global navigation of the seaways, transparent contracts, rule of law, condemnation of genocide like is happening to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, mm -hmm. or it's going to be more of the globe drifting toward Chinese Communist Party leadership. And the only reason people would do that, third party nations would do that, is not because they prefer uh, Chinese communist values to American values, but because they worry that America is weak. We need our commander in chief to be strong, both in these conversations with Chairman Xi, but uh, more proximately at this moment in arming the Ukrainians immediately and rapidly. Speaking of drifting, we drifted off Ukraine for a minute. Democrats have pointed to former President Donald Trump's handling of his relationship with President Zelensky, reportedly asking Zelensky for political help in exchange for aid. President Trump also reportedly ordered Mike Pence to not attend President Zelensky's inauguration back in 2019. Does the former president deserve some criticism for what some say is a poor record on Ukraine and Russia? Well, the former president said that uh, he had a perfect phone call. It was obviously not a perfect phone call. There was a lot wrong with it. But ultimately, the aid did get to Ukraine at that point. So I think the broader point, rather than make the, making this partisan right versus left, is we should recognize three administrations in a row we haven't been urgent enough about telling the American people and the world the truth about who Vladimir Putin is. Vladimir Putin is the kind of guy who bombs women and children, and we should be on the side of Zelensky and the Ukrainian freedom fighters. That's true in the Biden administration. That should have been true in the last administration, and that should have been too, true two administrations ago. We need to oppose Vladimir Putin more zealously, more rapidly, more clearly. How compelling was President Zelensky in that address to Congress? on v Friday. Very compelling. Obviously, Zelensky himself uh, is not a standalone hero here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a symbol of 40 plus million Ukrainian freedom fighters. But this is a it's a horrific thing to see all the human suffering and the tragedy. But it's a pretty glorious thing to see human courage on a large stage. We believe in America. It's mm -hmm. a part of our foundational creed that 7.8 billion people on the globe were created in God's image with dignity. Government doesn't give us our rights. Our rights come to us from God. God, and government is just a shared tool to secure them. And yep. you see that spirit, that American uh, Philadelphia 1787 spirit yeah. in, in Zelensky right now. Somebody said, when is the last time that Congress united gave a president a standing ovation? Uh, I want to move on if I can. Uh, the SCOTA Supreme Court nomination hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson begin tomorrow. Your colleague on the Judiciary Committee, Josh Hawley, said this of her time on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Quoting here, Judge Jackson has a pattern of letting child porn offenders off the hook for their appalling crimes. Both as a judge and as a policymaker, the White House responded, quoting again, overwhelming majority of Jackson's cases involving child sex crimes, the sentences Judge Jackson imposed were consistent with or above what the government or U.S. probation recommended. Where do you stand on this, Senator? Yeah, so Supreme Court justices get lifetime tenure, and before that happens, there needs to be a vigorous, mm -hmm. rigorous uh, right. vetting of their records, and there are things in Judge Jackson's record that are troubling. I'm glad we're having the confirmation hearing starting tomorrow afternoon. I hope, uh, tomorrow morning, I guess, I hope Judge Jackson will be very forthcoming and transparent. The American people in the United States Senate and our advise and consent responsibilities mm -hmm. need to understand this and uh, there are things in this record that are troubling yeah I'm just curious do you think there's going to be the acrimony that we have seen in some of these past 
nomination processes, not, not Brett Kavanaugh because that was over the top, but it seems to me like a lot of Republicans have kind of withheld their opinion in this because it really doesn't change the balance of the court. Still 6-3, she's a liberal. Your final thoughts? The, the idiocracy version of Senate confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court have been getting stupider and stupider since the Bork hearings in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that Democrats tried to do to Brett Kavanaugh and his wife and his kids were just unconscionably wicked. Yeah. Um, but it's a part of a pattern that's been going on for 30 years. I want us to vet Judge Jackson's judicial philosophy. Yeah. I don't want us to attack her as a human. Um, I want us to be having a debate about what her judicial philosophy is because when you go on the court, if you get lifetime tenure, it's because you don't confuse yourself with a super legislator, and we need to know that that judicial modesty there is there and that was responsible. And certainly, Judge Kavanaugh did not get due process, sure. which he deserved. Senator, thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you, Trace.